And you know, sanctification is actually not a bad thing to teach to non-believers, right? In one sense. First, they must be born again, yes, but the sanctification process is actually a good thing to proclaim to non-believers because it shows that God is in the business of redemption. Well, good morning. I'm glad that we're here. I guess we'll get started. So we're going to be going through the lessons of holiness and sanctification. And if you have your Bibles, please open us to 1 Peter. And uh, we'll be reading from verse 13. There. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not from perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, and the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word that the good news was preached to you. Let's pray. Father our God, we're about to um, go through a momentous task of explaining the basics of holiness and sanctification. I pray that there will be wisdom and discernment upon me as we go through this. I pray for the congregation here that they have eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, I pray that you empower us, you embolden us, and you clarify a lot of things for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peter was writing this to Christians that were in exile all across the known Roman Empire. And there were some Christians that were just living normal life, and there were some Christians that were being persecuted for their faith. Yet, what was their crime? Well, some of their crimes were being charitable, not offering sacrifices to Caesar, not claiming that Caesar is Lord, rather Jesus Christ is Lord, not giving themselves over to debauchery and sexual immorality, but rather maintain purity and holiness. And as a result, um, this is what led them to severe persecution for what they were called to do. And there were also some Christians in the midst of this in which they were very tempted to compromise a little bit on becoming a little bit more like the world. At least it will help, you know, ease up the pain a little bit of the pains of persecution. And yet Peter was writing this to these people who, based on what Peter's saying, is their exile. They were sojourners. They were in the midst of a dark and pagan world, but they were called to a higher calling of holiness. In fact, a couple verses before the passage that we read, he reminds them of the glorious gospel that was given to them. As it says in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but to you in these things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, which angels long to look. He was referring to the Old Testament prophets and priests that wrote the Old Testament. 
that they somehow, and it's not exactly explained, they somehow knew that they were not just serving the people in their day and age, but they were also serving us, that we as Gentile, be- Gentile believers and Messianic Jews will look at the full picture and see the full revelation that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is the glorious gospel that Jesus Christ came to save sinners that he lived a perfect life and did not come to abolish the law, but fulfill the law. And he died upon a criminal's death, suffered, and was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose again on the third day. This is the message, the glorious message of the gospel. And if 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 they believe this gospel, then their lives should reflect that, that they look, they should look towards, as Peter writes, in the latter part of verse 13, that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ to look forward to the time when Jesus Christ is coming back. That is your hope. Your hope is that you will be glorified when you die, that your lives should be ready and quick for action and be ready towards uh, your body being glorified. Now, this was back many centuries ago, in uh, many centuries ago, and yet, the problems of compromise within Christians still of compromising their holiness and sanctification still rang today. In fact, it wasn't new uh, in J.C. Ryle's time. He actually wrote a marvelous book called, ironically, Holiness. And in this book, which was written in 1877, he writes this, which I found very profound. Quote, It is vain to shut our eyes to the fact there is a vast quantity of so-called Christianity nowadays which you cannot declare positively unsound, but which nevertheless is not full measure, good weight, and 16 ounces to the pound, is a Christianity which there is undeniably something about Christ, something about grace, something about faith, and something about repentance, and something about holiness, but it's not the real thing as it is in the Bible." What he was noticing is in the church that there was a vast downgrade in teaching about holiness and sanctification in the Christian life. That was often vague, misty, is meant to be subjective and and to one's own personal interpretation. This was written over a century ago, and we see it no difference in today. And I think there needs to be a reformation for a desire to want to pursue holiness. And often the accusation that is against holiness and sanctification is, well, if you, if you teach holiness and sanctification, if you teach and expound the law, you're teaching legalism. You're teaching being a Pharisee. That's often the cry against this. But however, as we'll soon see in, in a little bit, that what they're doing is being legalistic, being Pharisee, and not teaching holiness. Now, I want to, pre- I want to emphasize this. This is not an extensive... Um, I'm not going to do holiness and sanctification justice in this lesson. Um, that's such a vast and big topic even to distill down into 40 minutes. That's why it takes a whole Bible to have a whole Christian it will take a lifetime, not actually not until we even get to glory, until we see the full, um, what it means to be um, holy and set apart. But I want to sort of lay out this lesson a little bit. The first I want to lay out is the foundation of, of holiness, which is the gospel. The second is the necessity of holiness. Why is holiness necessary? And third is Third is the signs and mark of holiness. And fourth, if we do have time, we'll see some practical ways on how to pursue holiness. So the first off is the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? It's believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins. That as soon as a person puts their faith in Christ Jesus, he is what the Bible declares justified. As Romans 1.17 says, the righteous shall live by faith. He is declared righteous. Or he is declared holy. We are forever declared righteous in the sight of God. That we're not just acceptable, we are accepted. We are adopted as sons and daughters to an eternal kingdom. There's nothing that can take away our justification. It is God's permanent seal of adoption into his kingdom. And as we know, justification is a work of God. It is God who justifies the ungodly. 
as Romans 8 29 says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he's also glorified. Each one of those Greek words is an active verb, and the subject is God. It's God who is doing the work of salvation in a believer. It's God doing the complete work of our salvation. So if we understand justification in that category, then we can also understand the category of sanctification, in which sanctification is, is what's making us holy. Justification is what declares us holy. And as we as Protestants, we also believe that justification is what precedes sanctification. We are first justified. And in the, men- in the verse I actually mentioned, if you notice, it goes from justification to immediately glorification, that we are going to be immediately glorified when we die, that our, su- that our works contribute nothing to merit our own salvation. Sanctification is the process that is preparing us for glorification. And as we know, the reality is none of us will ever be perfect in this life, nor are we ever going to be. That's what makes glorification, that goal that Peter looks to, such a desire. I want to be glorified. I want to be absent from my sin. For my sin is what's destroying me. It's killing my body. It's hurting my relationships when I fail. It's the goal. It's the prize. And if we actually recognize that that is the state of where we are, then we are on the right track to properly understand what holiness is. And you know, sanctification is actually not a bad thing to teach to non-believers, right? In one sense. First, they must be born again, yes, but the sanctification process is actually a good thing to proclaim to non-believers because it shows that God is in the business of redemption, of, of redemption of person. Take a look at Ephesians 2, chapter, sorry, yeah, Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. You were dead in your sins and trespasses in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince and power of the air, the spirits now at work and sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. He just lists three powerful verses of the total depravity of our human nature that we were sucked into this worldly system, being in the kingdom of darkness and living according to our own flesh. But verse 4 is so glorious that, but God, so rich in mercy, he resurrected our dead carcass and made us alive in him. And that we're saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, as any man should boast. And for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We see that um, in that those 10 verses, we see a state of where we once were, what God has done, and what God has prepared us and where we're going to. We see that God is in the business of, of, of redemption in our own person's lives. So I hope we understand that there is a categorical difference between justification and sanctification. So sometimes people would like intermix the terms and often not understand their categorical difference, which is why it gets confusing, and often that's why the accusation is, well, if you teach about holiness, you're, you're, denying, you, you're simply denying that our works contribute nothing to our salvation. That's simply not true. In fact, what makes it so important to know this is that justification and sanctification happen at the same time. Time. When a person is born again, puts his faith in Christ Jesus, he's not only immediately justified, but also that's exactly the moment when the sanctification process begins. Sanctification is what makes us, sorry, sanctification is, is God's work, continuous work in the believer. So I hope we understand the categorical difference, but that raises a very interesting question as to why do we even pursue holiness? Actually, I forgot to say this. Notice, to, to the point of the sanctification is, it starts immediately at the believer, is where Peter ex, um, reminds us in verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action. In other words, it's almost equivalent to 
fasten your seatbelt, get ready. We're about to, you're about to live for the gospel. It's, there's a sense of urgency. Because after he explained the glorious gospel in which we uh, believe, now, therefore, this is how you should live. Preparing your minds for action. Why the mind, though? Because the mind is the facility of reason. It's how you make your choices. You don't make your choices by your own heart. You make it by your own conscious mind. Being sober-minded, which sober-minded speaks of a ration, rationale, having a rationale, have critically thinking, which is the complete opposite of what the worldly mind is, which is just filled with drunken, sensual uh, desires, emotionalism. It's inconsistent. It's double-minded. It's what often the Bible speaks of it. So because we are saved in Christ Jesus, we have the mind of Christ, and therefore we are, we are ready and equipped to use it. So with that said... The question that might arise is, well, why should we even pursue holiness? What are some of the reasons for this? Well, first off, it's a command from God. First Peter, Peter reminds us of this in verse 15. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter was actually citing from Leviticus 11, 44 through 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls among the ground. For I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall, therefore, be holy, for I am holy." Even Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 48, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. After he was on the Sermon on the Mount explaining the law and how it, impl- how it, it applies to the believer, he, he then concludes, your righteousness shall succeed of the Pharisees. So thus, therefore, you, shall be perf- you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Peter focuses to God because God is the epitome of holiness. There is no one more holier than God. There is no one more majestic than God. There is no one more glorious than God. There is no one more loving than God. There is no one more transcendent than God. God is the only being that is transcendent from all of creation all of humanity, and all that exists in the physical and spiritual universe. As Isaiah 6 speaks of the magnificent beauty of God's holiness, as he had a vision of God uh, after the, in the year King Isaiah died, he saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and the train of the robe filled the temple, the robe signifying God's importance. And the robe just, the longer the robe, the more important he is. And the robe just filled the temple and filled it all, all over the place, and, which shows his vast importance. And he had the cherubim, which are the angelic hosts that were meant to serve and worship God. And each of them had six wings, Two covered their faces, two covered their feet, and two of them, they, he flew to show. And what's amazing, if you think about this, is that these angelic beings were pure. They were sinless and they were spotless. And yet they had to cover themselves when they were in the blast of God's glory. And the only thing they could do is saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, for all the earth is full of his glory. And the only thing Isaiah could do is, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. The closer we get to the holiness of God, the more we become, in a sense, undone, and the more we see how desperately we need His grace. Why is this important? Because holiness is what 
makes God God. It's, it, it encompasses who he is. For God to lower the standard of holiness is simply to deny himself. So when he gives the command, you are to be holy as I am holy, it's a, it's a command which must be fulfilled. But also, in a sense, is what drives us to our knees to ask God for grace and mercy upon us. So it's a command from God. The second reason for holiness, it brings stability and assurance to the believer. Ephesians 4.14 4, says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and, and carried out by every wind of doctrine and by human cunning and by craftiness and human schemes. Holiness, part of holiness is, well, studying the Word of God and understanding uh, true doctrine. We need maturity in order to be able to stand firm when we are battered by the winds of false doctrine. Why is it that within the past year so many churches faltered? Why is it that within the past years many of them were sucked into this lie of wokeism? Well, it's because they were not deep in their faith. They were not deep in, in pursuing doctrinal purity. And that's why they were tossed to and fro from, from what the culture brings. Third, holiness confirms our election and calling from God. You know, interesting enough, sanctification is the only way to tell whether you are born again or not, based on the outside from other believers I mean, the Holy Spirit is not dormant and idle within the soul. There has to be evidence of fruit in the life of a Christian, like his character, his desires, and his life is just filled with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Yes, on one hand, God's eternal election is secret to himself, but you know, the men and women that are elect are distinguished by their own very lives. And it's also the outcome and the inevitable consequence of regeneration. The fourth one is that it strengthens the church. The church has always been strongest when it has a high view of the holiness of God, for it brings a greater reverence for God's Word. It it has a higher and more exalted view of worship. And it also has a great desire for doctrinal purity and clarity. And the last reason for holiness, and actually I found this one very interesting, is this. Holiness is actually the key to happiness. Often, you know, holiness is looked down upon in our own society as, well, oh, you are a Puritan, you don't have any fun. Or you... Or often is, well, you, you're, you want to be holy, so you're always so judgmental. You're always so more holier than thou. It's often, holiness is often viewed as being stoic and boring. But you know, the reality is, true holiness is what leads us to happiness because it brings us more closer to God. They're very much intertwined. That some of the most joyful Christians in all of history have those that have a high view of holiness. That through the, process of through the process of sanctification by the Word of God, we are able to sing as in Psalm 119, Oh, how I love your law. It is the meditation all the day. Your commandment to me makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, and for your testimony is my meditation. There's such a vast and rich and unending well and joy, spring, and joy of the Word of God and studying the Word of God. And we can see this epitome of this happiness can be found actually in Christ. You know, Christ, he had the same body as me, and yet he still never sinned. So, so I think we understand um, that understand um, some reasons why to pursue holiness. But I think another thing is, is, and this was a very interesting question that I had in my mind is, well, if we do something good, is not the, the things that we do imperfect? Like, if it's imperfect, if it's not what, you know, justifies a man, then why do it in the first place? 
It is true that even the most holy actions are full of defects and imperfections, and they are worthy of God's eternal wrath. But you know, God is still pleased with, with good works. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, it says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Such sacrifices of God is well pleased. Don't neglect to do a good thing to one's neighbor. Do not neglect to do one thing for the church. And be charitable in all things that you do, because these things, these things even though they're perf- imperfect, they still please God. Colossians 3.20 Obey your parents, for this is pleasing to the Lord, alluding to the Old Testament law, which says, honor your mother and father. This is pleasing in the sight of God. And 1 John 3, 22, it says, our heart does not condemn us, but we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask from him, we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So you see, even though our actions are imperfect, God still is pleased what they do. Notice that in verse 17 in 1 Peter, it says, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear in the time of your exile. God is going to judge our deeds, not our profession of faith. And we are to be, we do this with, in a sense, fear and trembling, in our time of our exile, which is pretty much now as we are in a very pagan world. See, the holiness part of the gospel is important because it's the fruit of what the gospel produces. The holiness aspect of the gospel helps answer the question, what did Jesus save us for? Colossians 1, 21 through 22, it says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now been reconciled by his body of flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. It is part of God's plan in the redemptive work of Christ to purify and sanctify a people unto himself. So, what are some... I guess, true signs of holiness. I think probably the most true sign of holiness is that there is a discernible difference between a non-Christian and a Christian. Notice in 1 Peter, as it says in verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. He was alluding to your previous life before you knew Christ. As I mentioned earlier, we were, in, we were once uh, in love with our own fleshly desires, and we reasoned and justified with our own minds. And, now, and we, if we remember the time when we knew Christ, when we came to know Christ, we suddenly felt immense weight of, of guilt in our heart and their need to, be, need to be saved and a need for a Savior and a need to be redeemed And we were born again from the Spirit. And look where we are now. I know in in the past I I was wicked and awful, but look what God has done in me. And that there's also a noticeable difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. There is a difference in a non-Christian in his desires and his flesh and a Christian's desires and his heart and mind and perspectives are different. It's important to note that our sanctification is a progressive sanctification. We're not going to be instantly perfect when when we're instantly born again. Rather, there's going to be a progressive order. And probably the best um, example of this is the Apostle Paul. I want you to notice this is in chronological order of when he writes this throughout his life. The first one was in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 10. He speaks of himself. He says, Last of all, as one untimely born, he also appears to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am, 
and by his grace towards me was not in vain. He wrote this in 55 AD. And then he wrote this in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, 7 through 8. Of this gospel, I was made according to the gift of God's grace, which is given me by the power working of his power. Through me, to me, though I am very the least of all saints, disgrace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then this was his, uh, one of his final letters in 1 Timothy 1, 12, verse 14. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing to his surface service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecu- persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Notice the progression that happened, that the more that the Holy Spirit is what purified him in his life, the more he begins to see how much different he was back then. That he begins to notice that there was such a massive difference between when he was then and what he was now. With the time that I have, I'd like to take a look at a couple of examples as to how do we pursue holiness Water's good. (laughs) So how do we pursue holiness? The primary way to pursue holiness is the Word of God. Peter mentions this in verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. It's the Word of God is that's what's going to sanctify you and purify you. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansing her by the washing of the water with the Word. It's the Word of God that's what purifies us. It's the truth. Hearing the truth of God is what purifies us. Sanctify them by thy truth. Your Word is truth. We believe that the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, in obedience. It pleased the Lord to make holy scriptures the sufficient way to purify his church, which requires regular church attendance to a faithful Bible expository church. We're so thankful that we actually have such a gift from God that from, that from every Sunday morning and even Sunday evening, we hear the word of God preached from the pulpit in which also is fellowship with one another in a church. None of this Zoom stuff. I mean, I understand that um, there are some people that have, uh, uh, they're, they're probably exposed to the coronavirus, but Zoom is unfortunately not a substitute uh, for, a simple supplement or substitute? Yeah, substitute for um, not attending church. And hopefully, once again, eventually when this virus subsides, we're able to meet safely again. But that's, we are called to fellowship with one another, to encourage each other in the faith and hold each other accountable in our faith and walk consistently in Christ. The best way to be purified is with a friend. And is there also, is there an evening church service or Bible study to attend? We have that. Every Sunday, every other Sunday, we meet, he, meet here uh, down, downstairs, and we hear the Word of God again preached from whatever subject either Pastor Grossman or other pastors have. But also, there's also Bible, every other week is also a um, small Bible study. Pretty much what it is, is go, continue to go to places where the Word of God is faithfully explained. Go to places such as reading good books that are committed to the authority of the Bible and make sure and that teaches it well. This is a phenomenal book. I haven't finished reading it, and I was so convicted by what J.C. Ryle has to say about holiness and sanctification. And also, don't let the Word of God just be on the surface level. Let it go deep into the nuances of your own life. Think deliberately of how your faith is 
applies to every aspect of your life, to work, to family, to the leisure time, to the parenting and finances. The Bible goes deeper and to the nuances. Often when the Bible speaks about a particular thing of how to live a holy life, it's often very specific. It's not left open and vague to a subjective interpretation. It's often very specific. Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. What does love look like? Okay, love is patient. It's kind. It does not boast. It does not proud. Okay, well, how do I be patient? Uh, okay, um, I'll be patient towards here. You see, it goes into the nuances of our own individual lives. Lastly, uh, the last um, poss- one way to uh, pursue holiness is the ministry in the church. Are you involved in the church? How are you serving? The Holy Spirit has given each believer gifts to help build his church. Prophesy, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, given, giving, leadership, and mercy. These are gifts the Holy Spirit has given to each one of us. So hopefully I explained a little bit as to the process of holiness. But in conclusion, why is holiness necessary? It's absolutely necessary because it is a witness to of our character on the great day of judgment. See, the evidence that God is looking for will not be our profession of faith, but it's how we live and what we did. The scary thing is that there will be many people who would believe, who will be on the throne of judgment, and there will be people who would say, I've We did this in your name, we did that in your name, but what Jesus says is, I never knew you, depart from me, you lawyers of iniquity. What they thought was good and right was instead evil. And also, it prepares us, holiness and sanctification also prepares us to humbly, to come before the throne of grace in great humbleness. You know, the older we get, the more we begin to see that we don't really deserve heaven. We begin to see that, we begin to see more and more of how gracious God is in our individual lives. We begin to see how good has God has been to us, how merciful God has been to us. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. No one, without holiness, we cannot see how God is working in our individual lives. And I hope you do as well. That's all I have. Let's pray. Lord, sanctify these people with thy truth, for the truth is good. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Pray that um, that Peter will remind us that we're called to a holy living, a living set apart by you. For you are coming back soon. You're coming back soon, and I pray that we will prepare ourselves to meet you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.